Greetings, true Romans. Welcome, one and all, to Americans Learn. My name is Kit. Please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe, and hit that ring bell notification. That way, all of you lovely, beautiful people are made aware when we upload true Roman content upon our YouTube channel. And today, 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 we continue on with our glorious Byzantium campaign. Madness and Devils, Unbiased History, Byzantium 3. And I want to correct something. The video that I said that came out seven years ago, the previous one was Justinian, actually came out three years ago because this video is also three years old. However, uh, as always, I'm joined here with my glorious and loyal Roman centurion. And so let's go ahead and find out what happens after the great Justinian I passes away. I know, folks. I dare not even think about it, Justinian gone, but yet here we are, the greatest of the greatest, the man who almost restored Rome, gone. Say it with me, folks. Nothing could go wrong, could it? Everything's going to be okay, right? Please? With a cherry on top? Of all the sad words Eastern Roman history knows, the saddest are these. Don't look. Justinian was dead. Don't look. What comes next? Well... Before Justinian died, Justin, Vigilantia's son that is, had long coveted the empire. Deeply arrogant about being the great emperor's nephew, absolutely sure of his excellence and wisdom and all that. In previous years, he had been married to Theodora's niece, Sophia, and met a- Oh god. She's used goods. She's not yours, sir. It's just your turn. A new administrator in the capital, Tiberius, soon becoming friends. So much so, he made Tiberius one of the many he influenced to help support his future claim. When the bureaucrat realized Justinian was dead, being one of the influenced, he told everyone Justinian had chosen Justin, his nephew, to be his heir as a final wish. The Senate went along with it, Justin II was crowned by the Patriarch, elevated Tiberius to command the excubitors, gave gifts to the plebs, pardoned debts to the senators, guaranteed monophysite toleration, and promised everyone Justin Germanus would be treated well. No. Justin II then called Justin from the Eastern Armies and treated him well for two seconds. Then he accused him of a whole bunch of bullshit, had him arrested, and exiled him to go govern Egypt. And yeah, not really, having him murdered in his sleep there. Again, invented bullshit. North of the bullshit though were the Gepids, some germs mud hutting on the Danube, who surrounded by Lombards and Avars were soon crushed, and their mud huts taken. The conflict left Sirmium open for the retaking, and Justin exploited it. The Avars in turn told the new emperor to pay them in exchange for not invading. Justin refused, and the Avars invaded. Tiberius was then sent to deal with them, but they just crossed north whenever he approached. As for the Lombards, the Lombards' Narcis had hired that is. They told everything they saw in Italy to their king, Alboin. In short, an ultra-civilized, depopulated, defenseless land. Alboin then invaded Italy, and due to the damage the Ostrogoths and Franks dealt to the defenses, soon took over the Po Valley, the no. entire north, and spilled some germs to take- No! Why? Lousy barbarians! By the way, I managed to find some time to play some video games, and I'm actually playing Medieval 2 Total War. Right now, the Papal States have been giving me a headache. I managed to conquer almost all of Italy except for Florence and Rome. But I will, I've, I've had two failed attempts to take Florence. But I'm going to get that city one way or another. And then Rome over the south, mostly the countryside. They were too stupid to know how to siege Rome, Ravenna, and what was it? Venice? Some island city near the coast. Better yet, the Visigoths in Hispania then took Seville and Cordoba, and the Moors in Africa started a revolt and killed two generals sent to fight them. And Justin reacted to all of these catastrophes by increasing taxes on bread and wine. 
All that debt pardoning and Gibbs giving drove things deep in the red, you see. And then no. the politics outdid themselves, with some Monophysite radicals now claiming that each member of the Holy Trinity had a distinct nature. They were soon accused of polytheism by their very own, and to defend themselves, they said it was perfectly plausible for God to have distinct natures and still be a single entity. Thing is, that was exactly what the Council of Chalcedon, the Council of Monophysites rejected, affirmed. Justin then pounced on this by getting them to sign an act of union, but all it did was drive the pleb Monophysites in Egypt angry, so the signatories backed off, which also angered Justin he started persecuting Monophysites again, inefficiently at that. Can you imagine what Justinian would have done with such a golden- <sighs> Curse to watch my successors F up. Oh, Augustus, the more I understand your suffering. Justinian, look away. It gets worse. An opportunity. As for Tiberius, he welcomed one of Paul's sons as one of his secretaries, a skilled youth named Morris, who later on joined the Excubitors, where he met another skilled youth, Philippicus. Meanwhile, in the forever irrelevant backwater of Yemen, there lived a Christian kingdom named Aksum, which due to being allied to the empire, Khosrau invaded and puppeted. No! Thankfully, the Sassanids were now dealing with their own steppe nomads, known by many names. Among them, partially, eventually, the Khazars, who then sent an alliance proposal to Justin II against the Sassanids, and not wanting to pay the Sassanids for peace anymore, he went for it. Justin II then declared the Christian Armenians under Sassanid tyranny to be under his protection, and Justinian the Younger supported an Armenian revolt in the Persian side. The sand hunters tried crushing it, Justinian fought them back, and war had begun again. Pulling legions from the Balkans, Justin paid the Avars a ransom to not invade the empire. They're gonna and invade! The irony was lost on him. Justin then sent his cousin to go siege Nisbis at the border, but impatient with the siege, he fired his cousin, leaving the legions leaderless just as close Israel led his massive hordes towards them. The legions then retreated back to the empire, leaving top-tier Roman siege weapons behind, which caused Why would you do that, you idiot? Israel then stole for himself. Justin organized no response, no, he was too busy alienating the empire's allies for that. And when he looked back at the front, Dara had fallen. Yeah, Dara had fallen. After so many decades thinking he was the perfect nephew no! of the great emperor, he got so arrogant and foolishly confident that the moment he realized the main eastern fortress had fallen, leaving the entire east exposed to the Sassanids, and that it was all his fault. He went fucking insane. Completely breaking down, Justin began having random violent episodes. Ah! Screaming like a maniac and had to be pinned down to stop. Bars had to be put on windows to prevent him from jumping. Anyone that got too close, he bit like a savage beast. And the marks he left on servants spread rumors that the emperor was a cannibal. Given the emperor's condition, the empire fell to the empress to run. Again, who made all Well, what's the worst that could possibly happen? All of the decisions as Justin was calmed with soothing music, and was carried around the palace in a mobile throne he really enjoyed. Sophia then gave Khosrau 45,000 solidus for a one-year truce, and then convinced Justin to delegate his authority to someone else. That someone else being Tiberius. Tiberius was Why? thus proclaimed Caesar, and gave himself the name Constantine. But that didn't stop him from being remembered as Tiberius II. In his vacant place, Tiberius named Maurus as the new Excubitor commander, and planned to rely on him a lot. It all happened right when a plague outbreak had ended, and with Tiberius giving Gibbs to the plebs and legions, he ensured their support. Lots of Gibbs, really. Tiberius Stop. downright didn't care for money, giving the Avars 80,000 solidus a year to Danube and close route 35. Why would you? This is gonna motivate me to really take all of Italy finally. Sardinia, Corsica. I actually took over Sicily, so I have most of Italy under my command, save for Florence, Corsica, Sardinia, and Rome. And I'm going to fix that. But also, you know what? I'm taking over Egypt. I was hesitant to go, but now it's personal. Thousand for a couple of years of partial truce. Partial because it didn't include Armenia. 
So much he spent that Sophia kept the keys to the imperial treasury away from him. She was, after all, technically still the empress. With the time literally bought, Tiberius was focused on assembling the largest army he could to fight the empire's many enemies. He both started recruiting plebs like mad and hiring barbarians like mad. In total, he assembled many tens of thousands worth of legions, mostly plebeian recruits, and that would bite the empire in the ass. It always fucking does. He then sent some of them to go deal with the Lombards, but they failed. So, after Alboin died, Tiberius instead paid them to not elect a new leader and remain a leaderless rabble. Khosrau then invaded Roman Armenia, terrorizing the locals, making them flee. We've it's like we have the Roman Empire, we reconquer Italy, we get back Rome, and it all goes to shite their resources, which left him supply starved in the mountains with Justinian the Younger nearby. Justinian then dealt Khosrau his first ever defeat, Go. forcing himself to retreat across the Euphrates, with Justinian killing many and seizing their leftovers, among them 24 elephants. And after Khosrau assembled a massive horde to counterattack, Justinian pushed back, and was later replaced by Maurice on Tiberius' orders, returning to Constantinople. And yeah, Khosrau did break the truce, attacking Mesopotamia yet again, but Maurus kicked his teeth in and counter-invaded to retaliate. However, in the years prior, Khosrau had realized that for all the damage he dealt to the Empire, he never did come close to destroying it. And no, given that his never. son, Hormit, didn't seem promising, Khosrau appealed to his lord Satan for help again. For hundreds and hundreds of years, the East had been a battleground between the forces of good and evil. What the monsters envisioned to end the stalemate was the birth of an entity so powerful and so evil it would destroy no. civilization for good, infusing the damned souls of all past terrible Eastern demons from Ardashir to Shapur and beyond, sacrificing his own darkness to bring it into existence, a truly dark day had been brought to the world. The era of endless inconclusive wars was at an end. In but a couple of decades, this world would understand the true meaning of apocalypse. Creating the Antichrist took everything from Khosrau, and after getting trashed by Maurice, he finally died, thank god. god! Justin also died, thank god, making Tiberius a full-fledged Augustus, free from Sophia's influence. And she didn't take that well at all. Tiberius would then reduce taxes by 25% for further support and then annex the Christian Lazica kingdom into the empire. <sighs> it's gonna get worse before it gets better, doesn't it? Empire to fortify its eastern presence against the new Sassanid king. Sophia then dragged Justinian the Younger into plotting against Tiberius, but they were found out and then pardoned. Then she did it again, were found out again and were pardoned again. As for Africa, the Mu revolt was put down by the governor, Germanus. Germanus the Younger. Posthumously born after his father's death, the half goff became friends with Tiberius. Ah, well. I guess in many ways, you had a barbarian woman get civilized. Which is a rarity for anything, anything from Germania. Tiberius, and sort of with Morris. Back beyond the Danube, the Avars had completely taken over since the Lombards left, ruling Bulgars and Slavs alike. But since hatred of being part of large multi-ethnic political entities is inherent to all Slavs, over 100,000 of them migrated south to the Empire. Straight up just walking in and starting to farm random Balkan lands as if they belonged there. Given the Slavic menace, Tiberius wanted a peace with the Sassanids, but Hormids refused to give back Dara, and the Empire needed Dara. Maris then began launching several invasions of Sassanid Mesopotamia, threatening Tessiphon many times. Tiberius then evacuated Sirmium, letting the Slavs... But I do know somebody who took Tessiphon. But that's a story for another day continually migrate south all the way to Athens. Morris then met one of the main Sassanid hordes in one of his raids, and crushed them hard, killing their war chief and forcing them to flee to the occupied Dara. But the humiliation of the Sassanids was interrupted when the news came from the capital. Tiberius had contracted a severe illness. Recalled back to Constantinople alongside Germanus, they found Tiberius on his deathbed. 
having only two daughters and thus no heirs, he married Constantina in chariot to the two men, who he then proclaimed both as Caesars, intending to divide the empire among them. Germanus no. refused the position, and so Tiberius just gave Maurice full power, telling him, make your reign my finest epitaph. By the way, it wasn't an illness. Sophia just poisoned Tiberius out of spite. Damn. Well, what do you expect from Theodora's niece? Use goods, after all, gentlemen. Hey, come on. Be nice. She did kill him, but nothing more. Morris, now Augustus of the Empire, would focus on three things. One, breeding. No, really, he had not five, not seven, but nine children of Constantina. Two, the Empire's finance. Because after Tiberius, someone had to. And three, and most important, crushing Rome's enemies. For that, he would assemble the best generals the Empire had to offer. Philippicus, now his brother-in-law. Priscus, a highly efficient, if reserved general. Comentiolus, an excubitor that absolutely despised barbarians of all sorts. Narcis, no, not that Narcis. And Heraclius. Heraclius the Elder, a descendant Heraclius the Elder. But his son is somebody we should pay attention to. Yes, fellow Roman, we should. By the way, I noticed something here. Because of how hot it is here in Chicago, my Roman centurion has a little red scar. You'll see that here. I think it's from the paint on his face. So it looks like he got a little battle scar right there. The ladies will love it. <gasps> you mean I get to find a true Roman wife? Dude, it's 2024. Don't bother. Okay. But if there is a true Roman wife, you have a true Roman man. Dude, dude, stop. Stop. You're embarrassing me. of Heraclius of Edessa, a veteran that fought in the failed African invasion of 468, Heraclius would join the legions and become Philippicus' most trusted commander. Being known as the Elder, because he had a far more famous son, Heraclius. The, the Heraclius. To force a peace with the Sassanids, he sent some legions to take over Persian Armenia, but when they met some difficulties, he put Philippicus in charge of them. Philippicus then invaded, finding and crushing a Sassanid army, who then yes. fled to Dara. Heraclius though went further, invading deep into Persia and capturing several forts. The West was in desperate need of help though. The Avars were now demanding 100,000 solidus per year, No! refusing because he knew they would just keep demanding more. No! So they just ravaged the place. Maurus then sent Comentiolus with an embassy to test if the Avars would honor a peace treaty. Comentiolus then enraged the Khan by being very honest, getting briefly imprisoned, but they agreed to it. Naturally, the Avars broke it by keeping Sirmium, so Maurus transferred 20,000 men to the Balkans under Comentiolus, who crushed the Slavic horde near the Anastasian Wall and started rooting out all the Slavic migrants. The Avars then double broke the treaty, full on invading the Balkans again. Comentiolus almost ambushed and killed the Khan, but the Avars were too fast. The Slavs then attacked the plague-infested Thessalonica for reasons I'm sure made sense to them, but Comentiolus got more eastern legions and saved it. Meanwhile, Morris was saving the economy by changing how soldiers were supplied, from just giving them money to buy equipment to directly equipping them, the way that monster Diocletian did it, cutting expenses in, say, 25%. Hey, Diocletian wasn't that bad of a guy. I remember he was kind of a Chad, right? Morris thus changed Philippicus with Priscus in the east, who was to deliver the news to the plebeian legions. Telling them of the 25% cut, the pleb legions revolted, threw stones at Priscus, and even when he rescinded the pay cut, they elected a new general to lead them. Morris then sent Philippicus back, but the plebs rejected him too, all while Hormids invaded both Armenia and Mesopotamia. Unfortunately, True Romans, defend Rome! 
Fortunately for them, the new general was loyal to Morris and pushed the Sassanids back, and Morris backed off on the pay cut. Priscus was then sent to deal with the others, letting one of his soldiers get caught with a fabricated message by Morris telling Priscus of an upcoming naval invasion of the Avar heartland. The Avar Khan fell for it and agreed to leave for 60,000 soldiers instead of the 100,000 to defend his lands. The eastern general then gave back command to Philippicus, who would then receive news of a traitor that led 400 Sassanids to Martiopolis, saying they were deserting to the empire only then to be let in and give it to the Sassanids. It. To counter this, Morris took advantage of the Lazican annexation by convincing the Christian Iberians to attack the Sassanids. To fight them, Hormit sent a war chief named Bahram. Bahram did expel the Iberians, but was then defeated in battle by the Romans. Twice. Outraged at his performance, Hormit sent Bahram a present that fully represented what he thought of his performance in battle. A woman's dress. Bahram then revolted against Hormitz, marched his horde south, crushed the loyalist hordes, and before he took Tessiphon, the man inside killed Hormitz, with Bahram proclaiming the rebirth of the Parthian Empire. While the Sassanids imploded, Maurice's sons had grown up, especially his eldest son, Theodosius, who became good friends with Germanus. Such friendships were plentiful, because after abolishing that old reform from that monster Diocletian, Maurice made prov- Hey, Diocletian didn't do- too bad of a job, right? I kind of remember him being based, right? I mean, unbiased history wouldn't get things wrong. Listen, this isn't satire, right? Right? Provincial governors, now exarchs, ruled both the administration and the military, naming Heraclius the Elder as the new exarch of Africa. Philippicus was then replaced by Comentiolus, who then beat a nearby Sassanid horde, but could not yet retake any of the lost cities. As he contemplated his hatred of barbarians in private, he received news of an unexpected guest nearby the gates. As he went to see who it was, Comentiolus could feel the evil in the air, that malevolent barbarian essence he so recognized. No! Despised, Run! Stronger than he ever felt before. Run, you fool! A blood first unrivaled, a deep wish to destroy civilization. Before him stood Khosrau II asking for the Empire's help in retaking his throne. Before the don't do it, don't do it, don't do it! ...the Franks into attacking the Lombards, but then they elected a new king and pushed them off several times. When Morris did hear of Khosrau's request, before instantly refusing, he was also told of the trade he was offering. Not only would Khosrau II give back both Dara and Mardiopolis to Rome, but also most of Sassanid Armenia. But then Bahram counter-offered, promising all of that plus Nisbis at the border. When left choosing between two evils, despite Bahram offering more, Morris could feel himself favoring Khosrau more, hoping that by no. helping him in his hour of need, that young Sassanid could be trusted to no. maintain a long no, it's a trick. the empire, rather than trusting a barbarian usurper that spent his whole life fighting Romans. When the orders came to help the Sassanids, Khosrau refused to let Comitiolus lead the armies, pissed that he just would not stop insulting him, and so he chose Narcis to lead it instead. Narcis then marched east with Khosrau, the loyalist garrisons of Martiopolis and Dara gave them back, Bahram then fled Tassiphon and his barbarians were defeated. Khosrau II was reinstated back in power and when everyone expected a betrayal, he honored his word, giving the Romans the Persian half of Armenia. Morris then recalled his troops it's to the empire, and with this peace, sent most of those legions to reinforce the west, having now trust in the Sassanid king, Don't if only he knew. Now Don't. focused on the west, Morris sent Priscus to invade the Slav lands up north to force them to defend it and to prevent more migrants from spilling over. It wasn't technically our land, but they still complained. Priscus then defeated two Slav armies and was told by Morris to winter in the Slav lands to save the empire the costs of maintaining the legions. But the pleb legions complained again and Priscus returned to prevent another revolt. Mar Goddamn plebs. Morris then sent his brother Peter to replace Priscus in the hopes that he would convince them of the necessity to save money, trying again to enact the 25% cut. But this time with concessions regarding granting army ranks to the sons of fallen soldiers and giving injured veterans subsidies for life. 
The plebs accepted the concessions, but not the pay cut. Instead, they wanted the concessions and the pay increase, with Peter agreeing not to cause trouble. Marius then got pissed and gave the legions back to Priscus to go both distract them and repel the Avars, now raiding Dalmatia. After pushing the Avars back and clearing the Balkans of most Slav migrants, the Avars counterattacked, invading and cornering Priscus against the Black Sea. Comentiolus was then sent to relieve him, which he did, also crushing a Slav migrant horde because he wanted to. Then the plague had re-emerged from Italy, spreading to the empire. And while not as bad to the Romans as it once was, it was devastating to the non-immune Avars. The Avar Khan lost seven sons to the plague, wrecking the Avars so much they retreated north wanting peace. Comentiolus got a little ill, but sensing their weakness, Morris sent Priscus north with all of his forces. Battle after battle after battle after battle, Priscus crushed all Avar hordes he found, destroyed the remaining Gepid Mudhut villages and won a fifth battle against the Slavic horde, taking tens of thousands of prisoners. And for the first time in decades, the Danube was pacified. Bitter in defeat, the thousands of traitors that had deserted the Empire for the Avars were slaughtered by them. Being a good winner, Morris then let the Avars have their hostages back. No! It's better to have constructive relations with them than to destroy them and have an even worse Don't do it! take their place. In fact, these insights into the military realities of the age were central to Morris's magnum opus, the Strategicon, a military manual containing the collective wisdom of the best generals of the age condensed into a single book. A masterpiece of the defensive attritional warfare the late Roman Empire had grown so used to. Plus horse archery. Lots of horse archery. But I actually have a whole two legions in Medieval 2 Total War of the... I don't know how to pronounce their name, but it's it's the Byzantine unit that's... They're horse archers, but they're... The, 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 it starts with a V there i don't know how to pronounce it but i have like two season legions that just like is a troll army i just you know have them shoot arrows retreat have them shoot arrows retreat and it devastates like my enemies and i have it on extra hard extra difficult the battles everything and i and i and i love i love i love my horse archers they're they're, they're my merry gentlemen but all these victories and imperial brilliance was lost on the plebs. All they saw was an emperor that wouldn't give them gibbs, the return of the plague, and now a famine, leading to riots. Theodosius would fall under attack in the capital, but was saved by his friend Germanus. Morris then gave the legions to Peter, telling him to go fuck up the Slavs. Succeeding in the task, Morris told him to pass the winter in the Slav lands to save costs. The legions complained yet again, but Peter insisted on the orders. The weather then turned for the worse. Several storms and cold winds gathered, but Peter continued to insist. Furious at being asked to do their job, the pleb legionnaires chose one among them to lead their wow. resentment the ultimate manifestation of blabbery and the epitaph of all that is corrupt and traitorous. Focus would remember all, just how bad things can get. Ugh, Focus, you fucker. You fucker! Just who do you think was the prime driver of all of those times the legions refused the emperor's orders? Just who do you think was the pleb fostering the bitterness and resentment oh, of the plebs for I work with plebs. Oh, labor, 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 labor. Fuck you, fuckus. His personal benefit. And who do you think was the one behind his emergence to power? Everything was falling into place when the internal and external minions of the eternal adversary striked. The end would follow. Focus's rebels were the closest forces to the capital, and immediately marched there. His demands being for Morris to abdicate and give the empire to either his son Theodosius or to Germanus, this being a plot to alienate them from each other. 
With the rioters playing ball, they seized all horses in the city, except for Germanus's horse, an act to make Morris even more suspicious of him. Germanus then took refuge in the Hagia Sophia, but before forcing him out, Morris, with nowhere near enough men to guard the Theodosian walls, he decided to flee with his Don't run. family across to Anatolia. Don't. As he convened with his family, Morris was struck with an illness, a case of gout that made traveling impossible. And now he began speaking of Khosrau II as his last hope. Morris then sent Theodosius to ask Khosrau for help, but later restored his senses and recalled his son back. However, when Phocas got to Constantinople, there was no one to stop him from acclaiming himself as the emperor. While in the city, Germanus tried acclaiming himself emperor before Phocas, but the Greens wouldn't support him. Seeing where the wind was blowing, the Senate proclaimed Phocas as the rightful emperor, and had him crowned as such outside of the walls, letting him enter as a triumphant hero. As the first successful usurpation in the Roman... Yeah, Phocas. He's the one who cares about the plebs. And their work. And their labor. Fuck you, Bacchus. Never trust a guy who talks about his labor and all that other stuff. That's right, buddy. Fuck you, Fuckus. Roman East in countless years, Phocas bribed the plebs in the Hippodrome for support and sent his minions to hunt down the incapacitated Morris. It didn't take long, finding him and his family in Chalcedon. And so, Morris was forced to watch as all of his sons were killed and daughters brutalized before his very eyes, only for them to be killed himself. Phocas ordered the heads of Morris and his sons to be publicly displayed, imprisoning his wife and daughters as he publicly damned the late emperor's memory. All citizens in the empire worth their salt refused to bow to the usurper, Good. Phocas using his pleb legions to hunt down every last one of them. Peter was killed shortly after the fall of the capital, Philippicus was imprisoned and forced to join a monastery under heavy monitoring, Narcissus was captured after a siege no! and Narcissus! alive in Constantinople, Comentiolus was tortured for his vehement defiance and executed. Germanus was forced to recognize Phocas as his emperor and kept on a tight leash. And Priscus, due to his recent famous triumphs, was allowed to live and join Phocas's regime, getting arranged to his daughter and entrusted to serve him loyally as the excubitor commander. Uh. With no morals nor restraint, Phocas purged the empire of every last shred of defiance and competence he could find, replacing the higher ranks with his corrupt relatives. But for all the damage Phocas did and would do to the Empire, it paled in comparison to what the true enemy would bring. With the Great Emperor dead, his generals gone and legions traitorous, though lacking the original pretext he planned for, Khosrau II still followed his creator's wishes and Don't. declared war on the Roman Empire. No! The usurper cared little for it, but near him, Priscus well knew that this war would be like none ever fought before in the East. Having lost his emperor, colleagues and now facing this existential nightmare, Priscus wrote to the only man left he knew could save the empire from the brink of destruction. Risking his life to do so, he made sure the letter got to him. And although Heraclius the Elder would honor the call, it would not be him who would fulfill it. For untold millennia the Romans had stood defiant, barbarian after barbarian, traitor after traitor, be it triumph or catastrophe in the end, there was always a hero fighting for the light in any crisis. Alright Heracles, save the world. And so it would be for this one. The following decades would be ones of conflict and suffering far beyond any scene of this age. The age of Heraclius, the age of the final war. It's time. Save the world. Yeah. 
yes, paid and sustained by donors of dollars, Dogecoin, and the comfy vibes. All right, so what have we learned here? The final war is at hand. Together, we can save what remains of the Eastern Roman Empire. Civilization can still survive. True Romans, make love to your true Roman wife. Eat some true Roman bread. Make and drink some true Roman wine. Then boot up and suit up and save the world. For the final battle, the final war is at hand. And yes, I am well aware that Heracles was known as the first crusader. So you know what? If we're going to be doing this, I demand, out of all of you who are subscribers to Americans Learn, like, comment, share, and subscribe. Follow Dova Hattie on his original channel, as you should, like a true Roman should. And type 10 out of 10, life-changing video. Let us go on a crusade to save the world. Aurelian would do it. Majoran would do it. And so should you. We boot up and suit up for the final battle. The final war. Like what a true Roman would do.